Today's talk I want to dedicate to my cousin who lost her son last week. He was 33. His name is Matt. And Matt, his first word in life was the word sunset. And uh, apparently I couldn't, I couldn't make his funeral, but my cousin uh, gave the eulogy and he said, Matt's first thought was of the beauty of nature. And so, as he said in the eulogy, it'd be nice if you dedicated a beautiful sunset that you saw the next time you see one, dedicate that to Matt. So, I'm going to dedicate this talk to Matt. Because what is a sunset? Let's begin there. We all have a common word when I say it to you. You know what a sunset means? But none of us have really seen the same sunsets. I know, because I haven't met you before in this lifetime. I've seen a lot of sunsets, but we can agree on the term. What is a sunset? And we see the beauty of it, the gorgeousness of it. Sometimes we're incredibly moved by it. So then the question is, what's moving us? Why are we moved by color? So then you think about, well, what is moving us? It's, it, there's an emotion attached to it. Sometimes we've all had that. Oh my God, that's beautiful. Is it the loss of the day? That's a possibility. Is it the promise of a new day coming? Some people see the sunset as an opportunity to go party. Hey, the sun's down. Now I can go have fun. The same is true of life and death. When we get to the sunset of our lives, we, we all have a different experience. Some of us are, whoa, I can't wait to get to the other side. And some of us are sad, of course, reasonably so, about that journey. And some of us are able to, uh, to experience the beauty of it, the transformative beauty of life in those final moments being on the planet. Okay? When I say it's similar, I'm just, I'm just getting in this kind of, it's the way I get started, <laughs> sort of skating around the ice rink. But the idea of near-death experience, and all of you have shared your near-death experiences, and you've had this profound, life-altering, life-changing, paradigm-moving experience in your life. But what is it? Near death. We all consider death to be this finite, or we have, not in this room, but on the planet. Sharon? It's freedom. Freedom, okay. So some people consider death freedom. Others, many people consider death the guy you don't want to allow in your room. For example, in Tibetan philosophy, there is, uh, there's a guy named Yamantanka. I've been to Tibet. I've studied this stuff. Yamantanka is the guy you don't want coming to your door. He knocks on the door. You open it up. He's got a big buffalo head. He's got tons of teeth. His eyes are like coals. And he yanks you out of your body, throws you over his shoulder, and takes you off somewhere into the bardo where you will be punished by all the sins you've committed. That was, that was Yamantanka for centuries until Buddhism arrived in Tibet and showed that there was another concept. So they call this meditation the death of death. Yamantanka had to be shown that we don't die. Consciousness continues on. And poor Yamantanka, his job was done. He'd been doing this for so many millennia in the mythology. And then he suddenly realized, I'm doing something that's not really happening. Okay, so it's the death of death. So when I say death, it's a relative term that we all have different points of view about, okay? We can sort of agree like somebody's alive and somebody's not. But the wonderful news that I have to share with you today, based on research, is that we don't die. So now the question is, where do we go? What do we do? What do we experience when we have a near-death experience? What is it when we have somebody, a journey where you remember, as a kid, a near-death experience? What is it? And that is a fundamental question of science, as we all know. What is consciousness? What is consciousness? Okay. That I can't answer today, but I can tell you my own journey to this material. Now, I don't know how many are familiar with Eben Alexander's book, mm -hmm. uh, Proof of Heaven. It's on the bestseller list. Mm -hmm. Eben Alexander, Dr. Alexander is a Harvard professor, 
a neurologist who's been science his whole life, and then he had a near-death experience and found himself in heaven. He had a female voice that was guiding him through this journey where he saw all these different planes and all these different things that were so important to see. However, for those of you who are familiar, Todd Burpo also had a book that was a bestseller, Heaven is for Real. Okay? Todd Burpo's five. So when you put the two books together in our world that we exist in, one's the Harvard professor who spent his whole life fighting this concept, let's say, and one's the five-year-old whose father is a religious guy. So there's, a, I mean, he's a minister. So a lot of, because he saw Jesus in his journey, a lot of people that are religious might think, oh, well, Todd's is the correct one, and the neurosciences. <laughs> but my point is this, we don't have a language yet on our planet to describe these events. Sunset is a word we can all agree on. Death is a word we can sort of agree on. But your spirit guide, your guardian angel, your who God is, what is God? Okay, these are all things that come up in this research that I just want to touch upon. But I just wanted to say at the beginning, you guys are so wonderful to share your experiences because you're allowing the planet to have a common language so that we can understand, experience, and help others to get through their pain. Okay. So who am I? How did I get here today? Well, Cheryl Birch was going to drive me, but <laughs> she, she went to see Shania Twain in Vegas. So, you know, I didn't get my ride <laughs> to Tustin today. But that's okay, Cheryl. Thank you very much. You're a wonderful person. And she took me to Virginia Beach Ions Group where I spoke. And she, you know, was the one who suggested I come and, and talk and tell some stories. Um, so, my journey. Um, I haven't had, but I've had a little bit of everybody's experience. I haven't had a near-death experience per se, but I've had two guided near-death experiences, twice. I've, I've seen ghosts my whole life. I've never found them to be that interesting or, or worrisome. Never bothered me. When I would wake up and there'd be somebody sitting at the end of my bed, I would say, oh, is that a ghost? And then they'd disappear, and then I'd ask the person on the house, you know, who's the lady with the long blonde hair who's crying? Oh, my gosh, that's the woman who died here a couple of years ago. And I would go, oh, well, that's, you know, that's a shame. And then just move on. You know, I got stuff to do. So my story really begins in a train station in Rome. For those who have been to Rome, and I was trying to decide what to do with my life. 20 years old, at that crossroads. <coughs> Should I go to Los Angeles and become a filmmaker? That was in the works. Or do I stay in Rome and become a screenwriter or something, a writer? Become Fellini. My choice, Fellini or Scorsese? It sounds like a, a dish. <laughs> so I took out cento lira, which is a hundred cent coin. Heads, I'm staying in Rome. Tails, I go to LA. I flip the coin. Heads. Oh, shit. Two out of three. <laughs> and because, because I said two out of three, I thought, oh, well, that must mean you're supposed to go to L.A. Okay. Hopped on a train, got to USC Film School where I had applied and gotten into, and I'm in a screenwriting class, and I start talking to this uh, woman. She's an actress. I feel like I've known her for years, and we connect, and we move in together, and her name was Luana Anders. She'd done over 300 TV shows, none of which I'd seen, and 30 movies, which I'd seen but didn't recognize her. But anyway, we had this intense connection, and we were together for 10 years, as that happens, and then we broke up, but there was something about breaking up that was too painful for both of us, and we came back together for another 10 years. She passed in 1996 from breast cancer. Okay. So she's the reason for my journey here because on the night before she was about to pass, I was, I had spent my week with her, you know, sort of helping out and stuff, and I had gone off um, that evening to an event, and I went back to my apartment just so I could sleep. And in the middle of the night, the phone rang about 2.30 in the morning, and this voice on the phone says, 
it's Tony. You page me. I said, Tony? <laughs> no, I did not page you. I hung up the phone, but I was awake, right? Phone rang, I was awake. Closed my eyes, and the top of roof of my apartment building blew off, obliterated, and a shaft of light came down upon me, as bright as any light I've ever seen, fully blasting into me, and then the sound of a train or a earthquake, more intense than a train, more intense than an earthquake, I thought, oh my gosh, the building is coming down or something, but so intense that I felt shaking in this bed. And then I was aware that I was in some kind of a volcano, a tunnel, but a volcano. And there was, I could see the orange glow of the heat. I couldn't feel it, but I could see the orange glow. And then I had the impression that I was moving up through this volcano towards the top, somewhere in the distance. But I wasn't on the platform that was moving up. I was the platform. So that was an odd thought. And then I heard Luana's voice in my ear say, isn't this amazing? <laughs> and it was her voice when she was in her 20s. I didn't meet her until she was in her 30s. So I was aware that it was a younger person's voice, but it was her voice. And I was, it was so intense, I fainted, dead away. And when I came to, I was still in the tunnel. I had just moved that fur further up. And still it's the intense sound and the sort of, and then, but I was at the top and I could see that there was like a way to go between this top of this volcano and into some other realm. And literally I could see like an old television set in the 50s when you used to change the channel, there would be like that bar and you could, and sometimes when you went back and forth, it would, they would merge. It was like that. It was there and here, there and here. Thousands of sort of fireflies crackling around me. Now, I must tell you that later on, later in life, we'll get to this in a minute, Robert Thurman wrote the same dream in one of his books. And I happened to befriend him and, and read this book. Identical. Identical dream. He called it the, crea the dream of creation. I didn't know what it was. And I had the feeling, and I said out loud, I don't think I'm supposed to go here with you. And then I passed out. So the next morning I woke up, I thought, oh, she must have passed. That was like her way of saying goodbye. But no, she hadn't. So I went over to her house and I spent the last day with her, sort of holding her hand. And then she passed and four o'clock, all the clocks in the apartment in her house stopped. Boom. And her two cats watched something or someone in unison, you know, little cat heads, mm -hmm. wow. fly around the room <clears throat> wow. and disappear. Wow. So... You know, again, you, you store that in your mind. You're like, oh, this is so hard. But, you know, what is it? What's going on? So then her friend Charles Grodin called me, who I'm also friends with, godfather of my kids. But mm -hmm. she had introduced me to him. And, she's, and he called me up and said, would you like to come and work on my show in New York City? Great. I had to get out of L.A. And so I took the next plane. And I'm on the plane, and I'm reading this article about Robert Thurman. <coughs> Robert Thurman is the head of Columbia Studies for Tibetan Philosophy. He's the father of the famous actress Uma. He was the first Western uh, monk in, in the Tibetan Galupka order. The Dalai Lama made him a monk, the first Westerner to do so, 1960. Very interesting guy. Um, in the article, he talks about uh, an incident. I'm going to tell you it right now because it's important. It's going to come up later. But I'm reading this article on the, on the plane to New York. And he says that when he was a monk, they sent him to New York. He was in India and they sent him back to New York. He's from Woodstock. They sent him back to Woodstock and they said, you know, your mission is to carry water for your Lama. So that's what he did. Carried water up and down and up and down. Then the Lama passed away. And some years later, Bob was in Dharamsala, India, where the Dalai Lama lives, and, and he had heard the reincarnated Tulku. His old teacher was now living in Dharamsala, and Bob found out where he lived. He didn't tell anybody he was coming, and he went over to the door, and they answered the door, and he said, I'm here in Tibetan, Bob speaks it fluently, I'm here to see the Tulku, which is a reincarnated person. And they said, come on in. So he said he went into the patio, and there was this little five-year-old on a tricycle. Remember those little plastic trikes, you know? So, like in the movie Shining. 
So he's riding around on this tricycle, and he says, he doesn't say anything to him, but the kid comes up and parks in front of Bob's feet, looks at him, and says, Thurman, I was so disappointed in you when you left the monkhood. And Thurman said, you know, it was like the look on his face was just the way his teacher used to look at him. And he said, oh, I, I became a, a teacher because, and he married Uma's mom, because I thought I could help spread the Dharma to people. And the kid was like, okay. And then he drove away. So now, I was like, reincarnation? Okay. If I want to find my friend Luana, these guys will know how to do it. So I signed up for a class, NBC by the day, or CBNBC by the day. By night, I'm taking classes with Robert Thurman. And by the way, Bob told that story a couple times because I've become friends with him. I've traveled to Tibet with him. I've traveled to India with him. He also adds a story just for everybody. When Uma was five, of course, he, moved, he married Uma's mom. They had a number of kids. They, they went to India. Okay? So he was living in India, working for the Dalai Lama's doctor. No electricity. Five kids. Uma was one of them. So he gets a, Thurman gets a job at Amherst, and he ends up going back to teach at Amherst, and he's there buying clothing, winter clothing, at Goodwill, and Uma disappears. And everybody's looking around, what happened to Uma? Where'd she go? She's gone for an hour. They can't find their daughter. They go down the block. She's in a clothing store. She's wearing a red cowboy outfit. She has the hat on, you know, the vest, the boots. She's parading around. Bob goes in and says, I'm so sorry, honey. Listen, I'm a professor. We don't, I don't really have a salary. I can't afford this. And she says, it's okay, Dad. I'm going to grow up to be a big movie star, and I'll have all the clothes that I want. Now, she had never seen a movie. So where she got movie star from, I'll tell you in a minute. Anyway, so back to my story. Um, so I'm in New York City, and I had an out-of-body experience. Who told me that? Over here. Is that you, Laura? Out of body, the out-of-body, first out-of-body experience. Well, I, I have, but... Or Dennis. I, it was you. I'm was sorry. You. I, was, I knew the direction. Yeah. <laughs> So I've had out-of-body experiences in my life. Again, like the ghost thing, like, okay, so what? I'm flying around the room. Okay, i got to get to work. You know, it just didn't bother me. I didn't focus on it. It's that experience of you're just floating above your body. Okay. But in this case, I was in New York in my apartment on the Upper West Side, and I had been thinking about Luana and thinking about, I wonder where she is, if she's somewhere. If she was able to talk to me, she's got to be somewhere, mm -hmm. Right? And I came out of my body like a rocket, and I saw New York disappear below me like a movie. Mm -hmm. And now I was hurtling through outer space, going at an incredible rate of speed, so fast that I could see the stars around me, the light melting, like in the movies. And then I suddenly took a turn, and I was in what I can only describe as a wormhole, because we don't really have a language for it. And I was traveling through this wormhole, <laughs> bouncing around, if you ever all saw the movie Contact, when I saw that movie, this was after the experience, I was like, well, that's it. Bouncing around, and then when I came out the other side, I was traveling not this way, but this way, whatever that means. I'm just telling you the experience. This way, stars going like this. And then I stopped, and there she was, standing in front of me. And Luana's eyes were closed, and she opened them, as if to say, you wanted to know where I am, here I am deep space. And then some knucklehead honked his truck horn outside my window. This huge truck horn. But between the time he pushed it and let go, I traveled back like a rubber band and landed back in my body. Okay. I forgot to mention something that's very important and part of my journey here. When Luana was dying, she said to me, I have this recurring dream that I'm in a classroom in another galaxy. Everyone is dressed in white. They're speaking a language I've never heard before, but I completely understand. I thought that was the morphine talking. What? She said, yeah, I think I'm going to another galaxy after I die. I thought, oh, that's OK. What's, I never heard of the classrooms in an afterlife. Like, what? Never heard of that. The day she died, her friend 
called me on the phone and said, I had the most amazing dream about Luana last night. She was in the fourth dimension. She was in a classroom and everyone was dressed in white. She seemed very happy. And then I mentioned it to her nurse and she nearly fainted and said, that's her recurring dream. She kept talking about it. So I sort of stored that aside. Classrooms in the afterlife. What? Okay. Something to explore. Now, I didn't find it in Tibetan philosophy because I figured, you know, if, if I could see Luana in this place out in the galaxy, how can I go back there? So if you have a near-death experience and you see your spirit guide, how do you go back? There's got to be a way. Do you have to put on a spacesuit, get in a rocket, fly out there? I don't know, but there must be a way. So that was my journey. That was my search. What's the way? And I studied Tibetan philosophy, and unfortunately, as peerless as Buddhist philosophy is, they, their journey of what happens between life and death is kind of like you're a wisp of smoke, and you kind of just zip around, and then you get a rebirth somewhere animal, depending what your karma was. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. But that's not what the research shows. Okay? We don't reincarnate as animals. We only reincarnate as humans. Now, you're probably asking, what research is he talking about? And this is what happened to me. So I found the research of Michael Newton. Michael Newton, how many of you heard of Michael Newton? Okay, a few. He was a psychologist here in Los Angeles in the 1950s. Did not believe in reincarnation. At the time he was practicing in the late 50s, the Bridie Murphy case happened. And some of you may have heard of it. She was a woman who believed that she lived in Ireland in a previous life. Oh, yeah. It was a big sensation. Time Magazine, Life, they all covered it. And so then people started going, calling up their psychiatrists, their psychologists, and saying, hey, I'd like to do a past life regression. And Michael Newton said, no, I don't believe in it. I don't think it's, I don't think it's useful. I, just don't, I think you're making it up. So then, one day, he had a spontaneous past life regression in front of him. Client came in, had a psychosomatic illness, his shoulder was in pain, didn't, went to see a lot of doctors, they didn't know. So while the person was under hypnosis, Michael said, take me to the source of your pain. And this gentleman said, oh, it's World War I, it's the Battle of the Somme, I'm a British officer, and I'm being stabbed by a German soldier. And Newton didn't believe him. Oh, really? What's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? Who's your bunkmate? What rank are you? Because it so altered his reality, Newton's own reality, that he didn't want to believe it. He wanted to prove it. And so he got all those details from the guy. And by the way, the guy called the next day and said, thank you. I'm cured. My arm is fine. My wife wants me to thank you. You, know, you really did a great job. That wasn't enough for Newton, so he contacted the British War Office and sent them this details and said, was there this guy? And sure enough, this guy had died in World War I. So he opened his practice to past life regressions. And if you're familiar with Brian Weiss, Many Lies, Many Masters, identical sort of journey for Brian Weiss, where a woman spontaneously, and most hypnotherapists will tell you, um, I forget your name, but... But most hypnotherapists would tell you it doesn't matter to them whether you're really having a past life memory or not because you're cured the same. So, the, you know, you're healed. In my case, I just need, I need a little more evidence. Or I needed, you know, if I'm going to find my friend Luana, i got to find a way to get there. Okay. So I was, in, I was invited to London to uh, work on a show that was going to be done on, oh, by the way, you guys who've been on shows, cable shows and reality shows, can I apologize in advance for everybody who's ever called you mm -hmm. and come up with a lame idea and then screwed it up so that by the time you see it on TV, it, you know, they have this weird music and they try to make it really scary and they do that creepy theremin music. Yeah. On behalf of Hollywood, they should all be taken out and horse whipped, can I just say? Yay. Because <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing. I mean... Yeah. I myself went around and pitched a story to all the networks with a really top guy, and it was going to be called Past Life Detectives. It was like this first step. And I, we went to all the great you know, networks, and they all said, it's a great idea, just not for us. Because they didn't know how to turn it into... Anyway, that's an aside. Um, I'm in London. 
And a friend of mine calls me up and says, I need you to come work on this show over here. We're, we're creating this, this really wonderful thing. Please help me. And when I got over there, it turned out he didn't have a show. He didn't have anything. He didn't have money. You know, the guy was just struggling to get by. But he introduced me to a professor, Robert Beer. This man is, a, is the, the world's most renowned expert on Nepalese Tibetan art. Okay? And when I shook his hand, I had that profound feeling of, oh, this is why I'm here. But I didn't know what that meant. I just felt it, you know. This is the guy you're supposed to meet. Oh, all right. So we started an email exchange. Six months later, he wrote me this email. My daughter has died. She was out boating. Easily the most difficult moment I've ever had in my life. He said the weird part of it was, as I drove to pick up her body, I felt like I, my whole life was leading to this moment, like I was remembering this event as it was happening. Mm -hmm. So out of compassion, I, I, I had been doing some research. I would read Carol Bowman's book, Children's Past Lives, and I sent it to him. I said, you know, maybe this will help. Kids remembering their past lives. He wrote me back and said, check into Michael Newton's work. So I read Journey of Souls, and the first chapter I picked up, it said, the first client he talked about said, in the between lives world, I see myself in a classroom where everyone's dressed in white. Oh, so, you know, you live your life to pay attention to things. Mm -hmm. And if you're paying attention even to my story, you know that this is a flag. So go check that out. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to make a documentary about this guy, about his work. 7,000 people over 30 years under deep hypnosis said the same things about the afterlife before he published his first book. Either that's insanity, he's making it up, or it's true. And if it's true, how can you show it? So I thought, I'll see if I can go and, and interview him because I'm a filmmaker. I've written or directed eight feature films. I've worked with, you know, some famous people and some infamous people. But anyway, I, so I have the capacity to do that. So I called up the Newton Institute and said, Jay, I'd like to make a documentary. Uh, the president of the Institute said, well, Michael's retired. He doesn't do interviews anymore, but you're welcome to come and film a conference we're having in Chicago. He'll be there, so maybe you can talk to him. So I went to Chicago, my hometown, and I met Michael Newton. And five minutes into the conversation, he said, you know, Rich, a lot of people say they want to make a documentary about me and my work. For a long time, people have been saying, we're going to do a TV show, and we're going to put it together, and, you know, and nobody ever does it. What makes you different? <laughs> Good question. Well, I say I'm going to do it. I will do it. So it's taken me five years to actually finish the documentary. But... In that moment, he said, all right, I'll, I'll do my last interview. I will never do another interview on this topic again. You can have it. So I interviewed him for two hours. He told me his story. And then I filmed his wife, who happened to be there, because I thought, well, this is a great opportunity to verify some of the more controversial things he had just said. Like I said, so what did you think when your husband came home and told you about his research? And she said, I thought he was nuts. I thought they were going to take my husband away until I heard the tapes. And she said, thousands of people saying the same things about the afterlife, no matter who they were or where they were from, saying the same things. That gave me pause. And I thought, that's it. I need to make tapes. I need to hear those tapes or film my own. So I started filming people. I filmed 15 so far. And while I was at the conference, they allowed me to film somebody who was there. You know, they said, sure, come on in. You can, do, you can film a practice session. So here I am, <laughs> setting my camera up. There's about 100 people in this conference. They're all people learning the process. Michael's there. He's putting notes on his board. President of the organization is doing the session. The woman who's doing the, um, you know, the, the session E is a hypnotherapist. Um, she told me later she'd never had this past life memory. Okay. You with me? Mm -hmm. All right. So I turned my camera on, and the world changed forever. 
I took the red pill. <laughs> I, the, the axis of the earth shifted while she was speaking because she said the following. First, she talked about her life growing up in upstate New York, normal. Talked about a little girl, normal. Then they ask, and this is part of their process, what's your first memory? People go back to their first memory, whatever it is. Then they ask, at what point did you come into the womb? And people answer the question. Now, I'm sitting there going, how could you answer that? You're not supposed to know. You have consciousness. You have a brain. How could you know when you came into the womb? But they ask the question, and people answer. And they always answer after the fourth month. Why? There's nothing to do up until the fourth month. As some people said, it's like being in a fish. There's really no brain going on. There's no electrical system that you can meld with. I'm just reporting, wow. okay? But they ask the question, at what month did you come? And then they ask, what's it like in your mother's womb? Is this a, is this a comfortable place to be? And people answer the question. They'll say, no, it's not. I'm cramped. This is weird. I, this is weird. I, I feel like my mom doesn't want to have me. Oh, I see. I, I'm here in this. This is difficult. Oh, this is really going to be hard, okay? Other people, very comfortable. I feel I can... My mother's a little nervous, but I send waves of love to make her feel better. Hypnotherapist, how do you do that? Well, I just picture like a wave moving out from my heart, and it envelops her and it calms her down. I'm just reporting. But my brain is saying, what? How could you do that? Okay. The next step is for them to say, now we're going to take a journey into a life, previous life that has some significance on this life. Now that's a fundamental question that's different from what Brian Weiss does or what past life regressionists usually do. Because the question is, a significant life that has an impact on this life, because the question is, why did you choose that life? Why did you choose this life? And what do the two have in common? Okay? That's what makes it different, but that's the question they ask. Let's go to a previous life that has some significance in this life. And then they walk you maybe through a tunnel or down a stair, wherever they want to go. And usually they'll start with your age, whatever that is, and they walk backwards. Let's go back, 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 back. Back, 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 back. Ten, nine, eight, seven. And when we get to the end of this room or the end of this tunnel, the end of this thing, we're going to be in a previous lifetime that has some significance on this lifetime. Okay. Now you could argue that they're being directed to that. You can argue that. But the difference is, they, the person, tells you what they're seeing and what their journey is. Okay, so this woman is there and she says, Oh, this is really disturbing. I'm in a gas chamber in Auschwitz. I'm with my friends. I, my head is shaved. I'm naked. We're waiting for the showers to be turned on. That's how she starts the session. And I, as a jaded filmmaker, says, well, that's a little convenient, you know, for her to pick something that was so dramatic. I'm thinking to myself, because, you know, I can't help but, you know, the skeptic. Like, what if she's making this up? But, listen, I'm a filmmaker. I've been around stories my whole life. I've been around people acting my whole life. I've been around people improvising my whole life. I know how people make things up. Her syntax, the way she told the story... I, all I can say is none of it seemed anything but real. So now the hypnotherapist, as they'll say at this moment, you can hover above this scene if it's making you uncomfortable. Let's, let's go back to a happier time in this life. And so she went back to a happier time in that life, living in Poland. She said her name is Anna Paczynski. I was able to find Anna Paczynski, who had died in Auschwitz. She said her husband's name was Joseph, and they had all these kids, and they were all rounded up and all taken off and killed. So she, they, the hypnotherapist very gently helped her through that process. And then at the end of the process, and this is the way they do it, at the end of whatever that life is, or whatever that death process is, they say, where would you like to go now? Somebody said it here earlier. I want to go home. Home. This is what people say over and over and over again. Now I'm watching this going, home? <laughs> what? <laughs> People want to go home. That's where they want to go. Wow. So 
So she goes home and she sees her spirit guide. Everyone has one. Some people call it a guardian angel. Everybody has at least one. Some people have more than one, which is a little bit like having a, somebody learning. You know, like you go to a restaurant and you got a waitress and then you got that shadow back there. And nobody ever goes, who's that? But if you do, as sometimes they do in these sessions, they go, is there anybody else around? And you'll say, yeah, there's somebody shadowing my spirit guy. Well, who is that? They'll tell, it's none of my business, they say. That happens. Or somebody will say, well, that's just somebody learning. Like, don't worry about it. Okay. Everybody has a spirit guide. Everybody has at least one. Some people have two. They've been with you for all your lifetimes. They've watched over every single journey that you've had. Wow. Then you may go, there's a number of places you may go. You might go see your soul group. And your soul group ain't much different than this group right here. There's 23 of us. No, there's a few more that came. The, there's anywhere from 3 to 25. This is Newton's research. There's anywhere from 3 to 25 people in your soul group. The average is 15. Most people say, well, who's in my soul group? You look around, you know, your life. Look around the room. And what my experience is, if it's somebody you feel like you've known forever, and you've all had that experience, mm -hmm. then sh even if it's your mom, mm -hmm. your, or <laughs> in your case, you know, again, that person in your soul group is part of your group. And when you go back to see them, even if they're people who've been stones in your path, you realize instantaneously, oh my gosh, I asked you to play that role. Thank you for playing the role of the person who made my life difficult because now I see that I asked you to teach me patience, to teach me compassion, to teach me loyalty. I never would have had that experience had you not done that for me. I mean, that's a profound thing to see and experience. And sometimes people in these journeys, in their session, they'll see like six or seven or eight people in their soul group, but they can't recognize, they don't really see their faces. They just see there's a shape over there. It's a guy. Because they may show up later on. You see? And sometimes they recognize, you know, there's Aunt Betty. Oh, my God. Carolyn, you're there. You're in my soul group. What, what are you doing here? And people have that kind of startled reaction to who's in their group. Okay? Sure. Well, I'll make it there. I'll get it. And then the next place you might go is the Library of Souls. Some of you have heard that term, Akashic Records? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, like sunset, like the agreement of the word death, like the agreement of the word karma, which isn't what it means. We've all heard that karma is carrying baggage and sins and blah, blah. Not what people say. Karma is just energy. It means action in Sanskrit. It's just examining karma. So if you play the role of the obnoxious uncle in a past life, your loved one can say, I need you to do that again. You were so good at it. And you can say, you have free will. You say, no, I'm not playing the evil uncle again. I, I'm done. Viking era, hello, we did that. And your loved one goes, but you're so good at it. Please play the evil uncle. And so you go, all right, all right, all right. Because you know, we're going to have a thousand lives together. And think of it as a stage, a play. We pick up our props. We pick up our costumes. We all get on stage together. And we play the roles with integrity and passion, hopefully. And perhaps we like do some good. Meanwhile, this is the other weird part of it, and you find this out in these sessions, two-thirds of your energy is always in the audience. Only a third of your energy comes here. So two-thirds of your energy is back home, watching you. How about that for a conundrum? Yeah. You'd think, and people will say, I can't bring, you can't bring more energy because you'd blow the circuits. It's just too intense. So we're on stage now. We're only carrying a third of our energy. All right, so now we're back between lives. We're going to take a break in a second. We're back between lives. Akashic Records actually turns out to be what you might call Library of Souls. And everybody has, just like everybody has a near-death experience that's different, everybody who described a Library of Souls, even though they say the words, different experience. Some people see wooden stacks with books piled high. Some people see electronic digital media. 
Uh, one woman I filmed recently saw these wooden desks that when you touch them, a screen pops up and you can watch your life in holograms. A woman I just read today, her thing she said was like being in a cockpit of a bomber, where she saw this kind of thing and she could see everything in three dimensions. You can examine your previous lives and stuff you've done. You can examine the lives you're going to choose in the future. Okay? And you choose your future lives with your loved ones, with your soul group. And they all offer to play different roles. And you work out those details. There's no script, but there's like three by five cards. Okay, we're going to meet, uh, I got it, in Starbucks on uh, 7th in Montana in Santa Monica. Okay, as I met my wife. How, how are you going to get there? Uh, it'll be interesting. <laughs> we make this agreement with our soul group to play these roles in this lifetime. Okay. What about animals? Animals and pets, of course. Now, as Newton's research shows, we don't reincarnate as anything but humans. Animals, according to the reports, have their own realms. Animals of the air, land, and sea. So they take the same journey we do, but within their own realms. And there's reports that if you need to see your pet or see your loved one, where are you? Yes. They come and visit you at any time. So I have many reports of people spending like hours and days and hours and days and hanging out and they're just they're right back where you were. Because your visual acuity of who you are and what you're doing is the same as it is here. It's no different than here. Um, so, and then eventually people get to the, uh, the um, Council of Elders. And this is where the woman made some really interesting uh, really interesting and fascinating stuff. So let's take a break. So here we are. We're back in the spirit world. And by the way, thank you all and all your spirits for coming here today or for allowing you to come today, for convincing you to come today, for, you know, nudging you along the path um, yeah. to come today to share kind of this discussion about uh, the spirit. Anyway, so, so now again, this woman is uh, doing a session. I'm filming it. She's now got to the between lives. Her, her mood is quite changed because she's happy with her spirit guide who she knows quite well. But when she gets to her council of elders or wisdom makers, many different terms for these people, anywhere from 6 to 12 people on this council, and they keep an eye on you, and they help you evaluate your many lifetimes. They don't do it in judgment. There's no judgment between lives. Ooh, what? Excuse me? Wow. There's no judgment there. There's only understanding. So when you get between them and people have near-death experiences and they say, gee, I was in front of a group of people and they were showing me this thing that I had done in my lifetime that was really awful and I got to experience it from the other person's point of view. You've heard, you've heard these I'm stories. Sorry. Or maybe you've experienced it. Well, that's... This is the level you get to. So at some point, you're in front of your council of elders, again, 6 to 12 average in the research. And usually only one of them speaks. And so she's there in front of her council of elders, and she says, why? Why? Why did I choose such a difficult lifetime? Everyone I loved was taken from me. Everything I knew and loved was destroyed. Why? And then she said, oh, they're showing me, oh, this is going to be hard to explain, but they're showing me that it was harder to play the role of a perpetrator than a victim in this life. Excuse me? My head shot back from the camera, and I had to look around the room, like, where was I? <laughs> what? Easily the most politically incorrect sentence I've ever heard in my life. It was harder to be a Nazi? Yes. Then a victim? Yes. How I dare can't. she? Can't. My brain said. But, you know, I didn't say anything. I went, oh, my God. And then she went on to explain it. She just kept saying, you know, every lifetime has choices and journeys, and sometimes we sign up. And she was having compassion for those who signed up to play the role of the perpetrator or the person who committed acts that had scarred their souls and had hurt them in, in deep ways that they were going to have to work out the energy from. Experiencing. She was having compassion for her torturers. 
Um, just an aside, I once ran into this monk who uh, had been tortured for 30 years, a Tibetan monk, and he was speaking, and I, uh, this little, little tiny guy, and uh, literally, every day, cattle prod, every day, electric cattle prod to the teeth, to the mouth, to the eyes, to every part of the body you don't want to think about, 30 years. And in the story, he told how he outlived three of his torturers. And I thought to myself, imagine the guy you know, wakes up in the morning, has his cup of tea, you know, by, kisses his wife goodbye, goes and tortures this old guy, and then eventually dies. And the next guy comes and takes his place and does that. And this guy eventually survives all three because of his faith and who he was as a person and his nature of reality, meditation. And so I asked him, what was the happiest day of your life? And he did this thing where he just looked over at me like a laser. And he said it was the day I met His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And as he spoke, you know, these tears rolled down his face. And I thought, sure, it was the day that he met the Dalai Lama. He escaped from prison and eventually, and he took out the cattle prod so he could show the world what they had been doing to him. Mm. But I thought, in light of this research, you think, wow, you went through all of that. You signed up for all of that to have that experience. Wow, amazing. Out of compassion, okay. Listen, I know it's really controversial what I'm saying, but at the same time, it bears out in every session that I've done, where people experience and examine the person who was their perpetrator as somebody they made an agreement with. Okay, I'll give you another example. The next day I filmed a woman who has severe aquaphobia, and in her session she saw herself drowning in her past life. She was pushed off a ship in 1887, she was an Irish deckhand. The captain was gloating over her drowning in the ocean. And as she was there sputtering and coughing and choking and swearing like a sailor at this event that had happened to her, then the hypnotherapist said, all right, let's, let's float above this. Let's, look, let's go to that last moment. Now let's move on up. And then as she got higher and higher and started to see it in perspective, she said, oh, my God. I see the captain is coming to me and he's saying, you have no idea how hard it was to do that to you in this lifetime. That you and I had agreed to that and that was so difficult for me to do to you, someone I love. And then she said, oh, I see now he's my father in this lifetime and he saved me from drowning when I was a little girl. All that in that moment. She was able to forgive her previous life perpetrator, a very close friend of mine, um, decided she wanted to do a session here in California. We drove out to Claremont to, to see um, Scott DeTamble, lightbetweenlives.com. He's a terrific Newton-trained hypnotherapist. He'll be speaking Bruce, here Bruce, we're going to take you... Uh, oh, Scott's coming down? In June, he'll be our oh, speaker. Oh, in June, okay. Yeah. Great, okay. And we gotta, we're going to send Bruce to him. Um, <laughs> Bruce? Did you hear me? Okay. Pick, pick Did you mind. hear me? Hey. We're going to go pick see Scott to Tamble. All right. And Scott is a virtuoso uh, at past life regression and, and life between life sessions. And anyway, so I brought my friend out to see Scott. And on the way there, she turned to me and said, Richard, I don't think I can be hypnotized. I just don't think it's possible. Uh, I, okay, that's fine. She said, I, my father molested me when I was a little girl. I never told you that. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And my brother committed suicide, and I found him. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm wow. sorry, you know. And um, I didn't know this about her. I'd known her my whole life. Never knew her dad molested her. Never knew any of that stuff. She said, but it might come up. Okay. So in her session, she not only quickly went into a previous life as a British sailor, uh, captain of a ship, and I was able to verify all those details on the British records of her this past life. But she went into the life between lives where she had a very profound journey into a lot of different things, including seeing her father and saying, oh, I see, I understand. So I agreed to experience that with him out of compassion so that he could examine the negative consequences of his actions. Because... I loved him before, and I still love him, and I was able to experience that so he could learn something from it. 
kind of startling to hear. And then Scott said, so what about your brother? And she said, oh, I see. My brother signed up to, for a lifetime to examine the energy of excess. And Scott said, well, I'm sorry that he wasn't able to fulfill that. And she said, no, no, he did fulfill it. That's what he signed up for. So the signing up for lives that we can't imagine ourselves to sign up for, because there's many other, a myriad of other reasons. It's not just one simple reason. There's a million reasons you sign up to do something. And somewhere in there, listen, people do things that are wrong. People make mistakes. They make terrible mistakes. But between lives, there's no judgment. You judge yourself. When you get back, you say, oh my God, I've done this terrible thing. We were, I'm, suicide is one people talk about, and, and people, when they talk about a previous life where they committed suicide, they get back to their soul group and they apologize. Oh, I screwed up. Here we were on this plan together. We were all had our own mission, and I screwed the mission up. And they look at you like, yeah, you, you did that. You've done it before. We love you. It's okay. We still love you. You kind of screwed everything up. And the person is, they beat themselves up. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, let's get back and do it again right away. Okay, we will, we will, we will. Listen, if you have a thousand lifetimes, it's just one more, you know, to do that journey again. And I was saying during the break, we were talking about, you know, how, how many years you might live on the planet. And I, I call that my, my fruit fly analogy because fruit flies live until the sunset. Speaking of the sunset. They live 24 hours. And to them, they gotta find a mate, they gotta settle down, they gotta find a preschool, get the right car, <laughs> find the neighborhood to live in, and then boom, they're gone by the time the sun comes up again. Dead. To them, we look eternal. We're gods who live for millennia, as far as they're concerned. And the same is true about the spirit world. Those, everybody, it's not that they're eternal up there and they're all-knowing. That's not the case. Your spirit guide, your guardian angel, not all-knowing. They've had their own journey. They have their own life, their own, their own journey, their own sort of progression. So, even though you might hear from a spirit guide who says, you know, you should always, don't forget to, blah, blah, blah. And when you hear it, you're like, oh my God, God's talking to me. But, you know, it's, well, not quite God, but it's like this approximation and I'm trying to help you. So you have to sort of examine it from that. Okay, all right. So now this woman, it's the end of her session, and I go up to her after the session and I say, have you ever had this previous lifetime of a person in the Holocaust before, and she said she, she never had. So then they looked at me and said, how about you, Rich? Do you want to do a session? Okay. And then I thought, wow, I'm a documentary filmmaker here. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm making a film. This is what my intention was. And um, how could I pass that up? So in a George Plimpton moment, remember him, Paper Tiger, he always yeah. performed? I said, sure. So the night before, I thought to myself, well, this is a great opportunity to disprove all of this, you know, because I am not going to be led anywhere. I am not going to be, somebody says, what do you see? And I don't see anything. I'm not going to make it up. I'm not going to please the, the interviewer as what people say the problem with hypnosis is, right? My opportunity. However, I know that in this work, you bring a list of questions. So... I thought up this list of questions the night before. I came up with ten questions. And one of them was a trick question. A question that only I know the answer to, that no one on the planet could lead me to that answer. Because I thought, well, this is great. If, if they're leading me somewhere, he can't take me there. So, what's the trick question? About six months before this, I, <coughs> excuse me, I was in my apartment in Santa Monica and waking up and you know how sometimes you hear somebody talking or you hear a voice we all had that you're going to sleep and you're give me that and whatever it is and you're like okay schizophrenia what's happening Boop, what? <laughs> but I was waking up and I heard the words vanum populatum what that's what I said 
<laughs> what? It's Latin. Bonum populatum. Sounds Latin, doesn't Latin. it? Okay. Italian. Yeah. Our Italian. I speak Italian, but it wasn't any Italian words. You know, N's and M means it's, an, it's probably Latin. That's what I thought. And I wrote it down. And then I forgot about it. Oh, yeah. I was like having a dream when somebody's talking to me in Latin. That's funny. And then, uh, like a week later, I saw it on the pad. Oh, yeah, that's right. I was going to look that up. Okay. Bonham. Oh, it is Latin. It means vanity. Mm. Interesting. Who's talking to me in Latin about vanity? I don't know. Populatum. To annihilate completely, to wipe utterly off the face of the earth. Wow. Wait a second. Who's telling me to annihilate vanity? I mean, I live in L.A. Where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> but as I thought about it, it was like I realized that it was like an older version of myself. That's what I felt like. An older version of myself was telling me this phrase. And then I was like, older version of myself? What would that be? Oh, oh I was a Roman or something? Oh, you know, when I got to Rome the first time, I kind of felt like I was home. But, you know, why would I talk to myself in a language I don't understand? A dead language that I don't speak. I mean, how goofy is that? And then I went, wait a minute, annihilate vanity. Destroy ego. Oh, I've heard that before. Zen Buddhism, destroy the ego. In Zen Buddhism, it means the ego is always changing, the self is always changing. So when they say destroy the self, meaning see that you're always changing, we attach things to the self. It's a, it's a concept of a process more than it is a term like an admonition. But this is an admonition. Annihilate vanity. <laughs> Whoa! You know, like a laser beam. Blow it up. What's vanity? Cars, fame, money, wealth. <laughs> Entertainment tonight. <laughs> I, I got to get that off my TV. <laughs> Okay, but I'm, I'm there going, I don't, what? What was that? So now, here I am, I'm doing my session tomorrow. Great. What is the meaning of Anum Populatum? Great. No one can answer that question. So now, I'm going to tell you my own life between life session. I've had two. First one was four hours. The second one I did two years later here in L.A. with Scott DeTambel. It was six hours. I did it to confirm or deny what had happened the first time. Because I thought, this is so weird, uh, maybe I made it up. So I did a second one. And both are in the book. So if I tell a story that you're going to read in the book later, I hope you don't go, hey, I know this story. <laughs> or, in the, or in the video. Um, yeah, that's right. So here's mine. He says, let's go through your lifetime. I just want to give you an example. This is what life between life therapy is, and it can help all of us because you can meditate this same way. Okay? It's great to go hire somebody that costs about 100 bucks an hour, and if you do a four-hour, a six-hour, a two, eight-hour, blah, blah, whatever it is, that's what it's going to cost you, roughly. But if you meditate, if you learn how to meditate, you can do a guided meditation. Somebody could ask you questions, etc., etc., or you can ask yourself these questions, and you can examine it later. It's not going to hurt you. Okay, so in my case, we go back through my life. I remember an incident when I'm 11. He, they, it's how they do it. They go back to a time. They go, let's remember something that happened, some significant event. And I carved up this finger with an axe. I was trying to make a bow and arrow. And I just sliced the end of it off, you know. And, uh, and then I saw, my, and I saw my driveway where I did it, you know, and I saw the cars, and I could see the age of the cars. Oh, there's a, you know, 1965 Buick over there, and there's a, blah, blah, blah. I saw them all. And then I saw my dad coming out of, the back, out of the garage. Now my dad had passed away a few years before the session. So seeing dad was that dramatic moment of, oh, dad's here. Dad's going to save me. And that 11-year-old feeling of my dad's going to save me. I could feel it all. I thought, wow, this is interesting. I'm in touch with the emotion of an 11-year-old. And he did. He saved my finger, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now we go back. He says, let's go to your first memory. And I went, oh, I'm being born. I'd never had a past life memory or memory of being born before, but I saw that clearly coming out into a cold metal, you know, a table. The doctor's face, I could see his, uh, the old things they used to wear in the 50s up on his head. I could see the mask there, you know, and both masks and these hazel eyes. As clear as your face is to me, I could see him looking at me. 
Like, are you breathing? Now, the weird thing, he was, hold, he was doing this, but I was looking at him like this, okay? Just telling you, this is my oh, visual, clear as a bell. I'm, well, it's just my spirit is there on the right side, mm -hmm. even though my You're little baby down. self is upside hanging down. upside down, okay? <laughs> I said, my father's not here, but he's on his way here. I didn't know that until I called my mom after the session and said, where was dad when I was born? He was driving to the hospital. Okay. Let's go to a previous life that has some significance in this lifetime. Okay, here we go. And I don't see anything. And I say, I don't see anything. And he says, well, let's just count down to one. Let's just look around. What do you see? I don't see anything. And I'm going to say it until he stops asking me that question. And then, as they do, they're very clever, these fellows. He says, just look down. What do you see? In the act of looking down in my mind's consciousness, I saw my feet in running water. And they were all cut up, kind of bloody. But it was cool. I could feel it. And I said, oh, I'm standing in a creek of some sort. He said, what are you wearing? And then it's sort of almost like a visual pop back. I'm in buckskin. Oh. And then I laughed. I said, oh, <laughs> I'm a Native American. And I thought, oh, that's funny. I'm making this up. I'm, you know, screenwriter. I'm making this up. And he says, what do you, you know, tell me to describe yourself. I said, well, I got buckskin. I've I got a couple of feathers that are tied up in my hair. He said, what do you do? Who are you? I said, oh, I'm a medicine man with the Lakota, Sioux. He said, what's your name? I said, Watanka. And as I'm saying it, I'm like, what? what? Then I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. You saw Dances with Wolves. Tatanka means buffalo. So you're, you're just mixing up Tatanka with some other word. You know, your, your conscious mind is arguing with you, with your subconscious. Okay? As it does every day, we just don't see it. Right. All right. So I say Watanka. And by the way, that's part of the admonition of the, these sessions, which is just say whatever comes to your mind. Don't edit it. You can edit it later. Just say whatever you see. He says, let's go to your tribe. And I say, oh, I don't really want to do that right now. And he says, why? And then I saw a, a town, a village, and everyone dead, all cut up, you know, mayhem, massacre. And then I felt this wave of emotion, and I tried to say, you know, um, they're all dead. And then I opened up a teepee, you know, I could feel it in my hand, and I opened it up, and there's a woman with long black hair, and her throat's been cut. And I said, ah, they've taken my wife, and they've taken my son. Just like that. Killed my wife, taken my son. You can hear. I still have the emotion. I felt it. And it, it just the way that sentence has that emotion in it, you think to yourself, why am I feeling this emotion? I mean, if I'm making this up, why would I have a connection to these people that I'm inventing? And there was no son there. There was just a woman. But I said those two words. Sorry for the overacting. Anyway, and so, um, and then he said, all right, well, let's go to a, uh, a later time in this person's life. And I said, okay, we'll go to my death. And so I saw myself walking along like a big muddy river, uh, carrying an empty whiskey bottle. And I said, I'm here to kill myself. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, the hypnotherapist. So, you know, why? I said, oh, why do you think? They took everything from me. They took my life, my culture, my people, my religion. I'm just a shell. And as I said that, I thought, ooh, what great writing. I mean, that's really dramatic. I like that. That's good. I mean, even that part of me allowed for it. So then I found myself bobbing down this river like a cork. And I saw myself. And he said, so how, how are you feeling? Are you okay? What's going on? And I said, oh, great. I just want to go home. And then as I said that, I was racing through space. And out of this blackness came a crowd of people who I instantly recognized. My soul guide. Who greeted me like an old pal. Some people, when they say that, see this person, they go, you know, oh my God, it's my mortal teacher. In my case, it was like, hey, how are you doing? And he was like, I'm good, how are you? So now, if I can pause for one second, it's to say that six months later, I was at a funeral in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. 
And I, by the way, I looked up all the stuff online. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find Watanka. Um, oh, I also said this, that the tribe, because he asked me who did this to my tribe, and I said, it was the goddamn Huron. And I know the Huron is in upstate New York, and I know the Sioux are in Montana. So I thought, oh, I must be making that part of it up, too. Anyway, I'm at a funeral six months later, and at the funeral I start talking to this fellow, cousin of mine, and he says, I'm a historian for the Lakota Sioux. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Well, let me, tell you my, let me tell you my session. And he says, wait, wait, before you start, what were you wearing? And I said, uh, buckskin. He said, do you have feathers? I said, yeah. He said, were they up or were they down? And I said, they were down. He said, well, that means you were a medicine man. <clears throat> really? Okay. I said, well, then why did I call myself Watanka? He said, that's what they call their medicine men. Wakan Tanka means the great spirit. So Watanka would be your nickname. Really? Okay. Well, then why did I say the Huron killed my family and tribe? And he said, well, you're sitting in the spot where they fought for 60 years, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. None of which I could have confirmed on my own. But it wasn't until later on I was able to confirm that. Okay, so. Mm. Now I'm in the life between life realm. And I first place I go is a classroom. He says, sip the therapist says, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go, I want to go see my soul group. And I'm standing in a classroom. A classroom. Like a regular classroom. Chalkboard. And there's a woman at the front. Uh, kind of a radiant person. I say her name. <clears throat> therapist says, do you know her? I said, I seem to. And then he says, what's out going on in this classroom? And I say, well, they're doing energy transference. This is what they teach here. I said, everybody carries with them through all their lifetimes the, life, the memories of all their lifetimes in geometric shapes. Some people call them fractals. Other people call them other words. I forget what I said, but... <clears throat> Each one represents the emotional impact of each lifetime. And you carry them through every lifetime, and they function like ball bearings, I said. What? And then I said, you know how ball bearings work. The machine, they help the machine work. Well, these emotional memories of all your lifetimes go through you. So when in a time of stress, you might call upon an emotional memory to help you get through that moment. I said, however, after a long and glorious lifetime, you may pick up pieces of dirt and junk that it affects the energy, so they bring them to this classroom and they repair them. Now, none of these words I'm saying are in Rich Martini's book, Vernacular, but I said it all then. And then uh, he said, where do you want to go? And I said, well, I want to see Luana. Okay, well, we're in her classroom. I look in the back of the class, and there she is. About 21 years old, blonde hair, ponytail. She looks at me like, what are you, what are you doing here? Now, what's interesting is that when I went to the first classroom, everybody kind of looked at me like, oh, this is teacher's friend. Oh, this is exciting. You know, oh, they're talking to each other. That's fun. In this classroom, I got the impression I was interrupting them. And I said so. <clears throat> I feel like I'm not supposed to come here. This is a very high class in healing. And the therapist said, so how, do you, how does it work? How do you heal? And I see everyone in the class look around at me like, Oh, are you going to do the talking now? I mean, it was just it was weird, like you would be an you know, annoying person in a class. The teacher kind of goes, you know, Jack Benny style, okay, let's hear Rich talk about how we're going to heal people. <laughs> and I named his name, and I said, well, when people go to see their doctor, that doctor calls upon the healing light of the universe, the doctor or the shaman or the healer. They call upon the healing light of the universe to come through them and help the client and help the patient. And these people here in this classroom learn how to facilitate that healing energy into people. And one of the students turns around and goes, oh, please, that is so simplistic. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting criticized in the afterlife. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I say, well, I, you know, I'm, uh, you know I, it is kind of simplistic what I'm saying. Uh -huh. However, I mean, I said, there's all kinds of a myriad of possibilities. The client... The patient may have signed up to have a, to experience an illness that the doctor's not going to be able to fix or cure because they wanted to be able to go through that in this lifetime. There's that possibility. There's the possibility of the doctor signing up to, to not help somebody that day. Okay, so there's a myriad of, of possibilities, a myriad. But 
So that's the more complex version, but this class is teaching in the healing light of the universe. Okay, very good. And by the way, I've heard about the healing light of the universe in many other sessions. So when, I, so when we got to my council, I had my ten questions, right? Bottom populatum, what's the meaning of pop, bottom populatum? And I kid you not, I had eight people in my council. First question was, and what's weird is that when I, when I remembered it, I thought that the hypnotherapist asked the questions. But I, when I watched the tape, I asked all the questions. I had just written them out the night before and handed them to them, but I stood there as if I had memorized them and asked each question, and they answered each one. What's the meaning of vana populatum? My counsel erupted in laughter. <laughs> and the lead council member said, why don't you ask Rich? He knows the answer to that. And as he said that, I saw an image of myself off to the side lying on the couch. And two things came from that answer. One, I realized if he could have said, why don't you already know the answer to that, right? He didn't say that. He said, Rich already knows the answer to that. So in other words, in front of him, addressing him was my eternal or higher self. Okay? But Rich, the temporary self, is on the couch. And the second thing I learned from that is I realized that thing about my older self giving myself a message. I know about myself that I like to solve puzzles. So I gave my temporary self, the rich self, a conundrum, a puzzle in Latin, knowing that he would go and Google it. And that's how he'd hear it, and that's how he'd learn it. Because otherwise he's impatient, and he would never learn it unless I made it difficult for him. Wow. All right, so now I went through all my questions, and all of them were all deeply personal, but they're all in the book. And I'll just get to the last question, which really relates to all of us in this room. It relates to everyone. The question was, why did I choose me? Isn't that kind of what our question is on the planet? All the stuff we've gone through, all the difficulties. Why did you choose your mom? Okay. Why did I choose me? Simple, but really complex. And the answer was, every thought, action, word, or deed contains energy. You write an email, it contains part of your energy. So consider it sacred. It's sacred energy. It's you. You paint a painting, you write a song, you make a film. You create anything. You take care of bees. The energy that you put into that, that honey there, represents angel. The energy of her craft and work and who she's been for many lifetimes has gone into the manufacture of that honey. Okay? That's what I said. Not that thing about Angie, but, but that idea of everything that we do contains our energy. I chose in an outside-the-box way to be a filmmaker because I felt that the healing energy and laughter was easier to achieve. That I could tell a joke and instantly change someone's disposition. I could heal Heal them, help them out of compassion with one belly laugh. And then I said, however, tears work the same way. They just require catharsis. Now, it's not a word I normally use, catharsis, but there it is. It's accurate. I was saying it. I went, catharsis, that's interesting. Tears require catharsis. You have to go through the tears to get to the knowledge. Whereas the laughter could take you right there to the instant healing. And I said, you know, it's just a shame, thinking about my career, I said, it's just a shame Rich isn't very good at it. And then I got a laugh from the hypnotherapist, and I got a laugh from all of my counsel. It's just a shame he's not so good at it. So I thought, okay, that's weird. I'm just, I'm, I'm observing my own life from the point of view of, you know, my many lifetimes. And then I said, I think that's about to change. So that's going to change for him, for Rich. Oh, okay. And then as I came back to consciousness, I said, is there anything that I can impart to the planet that I can share with people that's going to be of value to them? And the therapist said, oh, I'm sorry, and the, the, uh, the message I got from my spirit guide is three words, just let go. 
pass that along. So you know what that means. Just let go. Okay? All right, so I then got addicted to this stuff. I started filming it. I started documenting it. I've been doing it for five years. That's how the book came out of it. Um, while I was working on the movie Salt, the Angelina Jolie film. Yep. Yes. Okay. I'm, yes. I, I'm in that movie. You are. Hmm. Whoa. <laughs> I drive her out of North Korea. But I worked on it for two years. Philip Noyce is a good friend of mine, and um, he asked me to come in and work on that film. A couple of really profound things happened. One was when I was, I was working on the film one day, a New York police detective heard me talking about the research to an actor. Actually, three, I'm going to tell you three great stories. One is this actress on the set and I were talking about what I've been filming. And she said, well, I've got a story to tell you, but I've never told it to anybody. <laughs> okay, what is it? She said, you know the psychic John Edward? Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. She said, well, I'd never heard of him. <clears throat> and he called me up one day, got my name through SAG, Screen Actors Guild, called me up and said, your father's been coming through, and he needs to talk to you. She had never heard of such a thing. She had never told anybody that her father had committed suicide. She had never told anybody that her father was dead. And John Edward calls out of the blue and says, your father's coming through and he wants to talk to you. So, she, you know, she's used to people calling her up and asking her out. So she took her boyfriend with her to the session just because she didn't know. Like, what does he want with me? So she gets to John Edward's office and he says... Your father wants you to call your, your mother on the phone, please. So she picks up her cell and calls her mom in Michigan. Mom answers the phone. Mom, you're never going to guess where I am. I'm in John Edwards' office. She said, oh, John Edwards, I know him. You know, he's great. Oh, fantastic. What are you doing there? Well, Dad wants to come through. Oh, okay. Dad wants you to go down. John says Dad wants you to go downstairs and find a book. Did you do that? Okay. She walks downstairs with her portable phone. Where is it? It's, uh, it's in, not that room, John says. Keep going to the back room, at the last room in the hall. Okay, she walks. Now get on a chair. Up on the shelf, there's a red folder. See if you can find it. She gets up there. She says, oh, I found it. I got it. Okay, open it up. It's photographs of the husband when he was happy of them when they first were married, of them when they were a happy family before the bipolar illness came in. Dad says he wants you to know that that's how he is now, and he wants us to remember him that way. Okay, so now she gets off the phone. John Edward says, oh, one more thing your father wants to tell you. You're pregnant. You should marry your boyfriend. <laughs> she did not know that. And she was. And she married him. Second great story of Salt was I was uh, one day a New York cop heard me talking about this stuff and he went, Can I talk to you? Come in. <clears throat> okay. You know, guns, stuff. <laughs> Puts me in a back room, locks the door. <laughs> I'm like, He's got the rubber hose. Yeah, what, what did I do? He goes, uh, I think my house is possessed. I heard you talking about that stuff, you know. What? My house, possessed. I go, well, why do you say that? He goes, well, first of all, sorry, I shouldn't do a New York accent. He goes, my daughter, is, uh, my daughter is eight years old, and she sees a ghost every day. And it's freaking me out. And then the other day she says that she, is, she, was a, she died in Australia. And I said, well, first of all, you're talking to a guy in a movie set, so whatever I'm about to tell you, you know, just take that with a grain of salt. However, I said, you know, so tell me about this ghost. Separate the things that are bugging you. Who's the ghost? He said, well, that's the weird thing. Uh, for a long time, she described him. She said, Daddy, he looks like you. He dresses like a cop. And, and then I was thinking, what cop is, is hanging around my house? And then I remembered my partner who died 10 years ago. And so he took a picture of the girl's eight. Took, took a picture of the partner out and said, is this, is this him? She went, yeah, that's him, Daddy, except he's younger now and thinner. <laughs> and he went, how could that be? You know, he died 10 years ago. How can he be younger now? 
I said, well, in between lives, we present ourselves as, you know, our energy doesn't go anywhere. We present ourselves as we like ourselves. So if we want to be whatever it is we want to be, or we feel like that person will recognize us the best, that's how we present ourselves. So I said, do you like, did you like this guy? He goes, I loved him. I said, well, then is it so bad that the guy you loved is hanging around your house and keeping an eye on you and your kid? He said, no, when you put it that way, no. I said, all right, so what about this reincarnation story? He said, yeah, she just, she just came up with it the other day. I said, have you been to Australia? No. Are you watching something on TV? No. All right, well, in, in my experience, when kids are making up stories, the details are everywhere. But when you're remembering something, they kind of follow a pattern. So why don't you do this? Take out a map of Australia, lay it down, and see what she says. Now, he looked at me because, you know, he's of that generation where you don't ask your kid a question you don't know the answer to. And God forbid your kid says something you don't know the answer to because that's beyond your capacity. Okay. So he comes in the next day. <laughs> he sees me behind, grabs me, throws me in the back room, locks the door. <laughs> You're not going to believe what happened to me. And he says, uh, you know, I took out this map of Australia, like you said, and she points to Perth. And she says, I was a farmer and a family, and we all died in the drought. And then she burst into tears. And it was like she finally had a chance to say the truth to her dad, and he listened. To reconnect with him on that soul level so he could hear it. What a wonderful gift. All right, the third one was from Salt. Was I was sitting around one day going... Okay, I've been on overtime for the past six months. You know, this is not my movie. It was a great film, but you know, it's not my. I'm not getting paid for it. I mean, I'm just working. You know, and there's a lot of perks. You know, you're in a studio picture. Blah blah blah. Okay, but I'm debating. My kids are back in Santa Monica. I'm in New York. This is crazy. And so I, as I went to bed, I had this vision that came to me of a, like a quick flash of a Cambodian orphanage kids eating soup out of a soup bowl with a spoon. And I thought, oh, Angelina Jolie owns an orphanage that she pays for every year out of her salary, so my overtime relates to her helping the orphanage? That's eh, a bit of a stretch. I mean, I appreciate that, you know, but, you know, I can't tell that to my wife, you know, who's like, how much are you making of it? Anyway, so... The next night, I had the clarifying vision, and that was I saw a kid in the streets of Bombay in Mumbai, where I've been, and he was selling an illegal copy of Salt. I mean, I clearly saw this picture of Angelina on it that wasn't, the movie hadn't been finished. And he was selling it for 40 rupees, about 10 bucks. And he took the money and he turned around to his wife and handed it to her, and she was living in a box with their four children. If you've been to India, this is a very common, Bruce has been there, it's a very common experience to see people living in boxes. But the, the sort of joy in his face. And in that moment, I understood the wheel work of the energy of creativity. That my overtime, my running around, trying to make people laugh on the set, that that was part of a huge wheel that made this thing work so that it could, could create this movie, so that it could save somebody's life in a street in India. It was an illegal copy, so it wasn't about the money. It was about the energy, the quantum butterfly effect, that the energy of what you put into helps people, cures people, heals people. Somewhere on the planet, you can't see it. You'll never see it until you get to the Between Lives realm, where then you're congratulated for it, where your loved ones say, good job. You suffered through this thing. You said you could handle it, and you did. 